Thank you. Um, so I'm going to depart a little from the morning's presentation. So I'm going to actually do more of a survey. But this is a very idiosyncratic survey of, uh, of bank regulation, uh, obviously colored by my views and uh, my work with co-authors. So with that uh, sort of warning, uh, just broadly, uh, what are the trends in bank regulation? Well, for the first, uh, uh, I mean, the first uh, thing to note is, uh, you know, banks themselves have come from the pages of the history books, which is where they had been delegated, into current affairs. Uh, it used to be that at every uh, conference, academic conference, as soon as uh, banking was announced as a topic, people would leave because this was all about deposit insurance and bank runs, which was of interest in the 1930s, but of no interest today when such things didn't actually happen. Well, since 2008, things have changed and actually people pay interest, uh, uh, pay some interest to this. Now, uh, one of the interesting changes is we've moved from a focus on credit risk um, to also thinking about liquidity risk. And to some extent, the academic concerns about liquidity shortages and the systemic insolvency issues actually predate the financial crisis. They were well and truly being discussed in the financial literature. But of course, they've, there's been heightened interest since the financial crisis. And it also seems to me, once we start talking about liquidity, again, depending on how you define liquidity, there is a very clear link between the micro and the macro. They feed into the same pool of liquidity. Uh, we've also uh, moved from thinking about idiosyncratic bank regulation to more systemic regulation, not just of banks, but also the rest of the financial sector. And we've moved, uh, and I think this is a very important development from theory to extensive empirical studies using extraordinarily detailed data sets. And I think that's a very important development. So what I want to do today is talk about a bunch of things. Uh, and it's in order of, uh, of what I think I can cover. If I don't cover the last few things, that's OK. Uh, we'll see how much I can get to in 25 minutes. First, why regulate banks? Let's revisit some of the issues again. Second, what forms does microprudential regulation take? What are regulatory incentives? Who regulates the regulator? And then to issues which have become more salient nowadays. Uh, should monetary policy, for example, be sensitive to financial stability issues? And that this is something on which there's a lot of difference between people who come from the finance banking side and people who come from the macro side. Second, what role is there for macroprudential regulation? To some extent, uh, people who come from the monetary side would like there to be a separation between uh, monetary policy issues and financial stability issues. Financial stability issues take, get taken care of by uh, off by macroprudential regulation, leaving monetary policy to do what it's supposed to do, focus on inflation. And the question is, is that neat separation possible? And third, uh, this is an issue which uh, central bankers debate all the time. Should regulatory requirements be harmonized? Of course, we've been doing that for the last uh, so many years since Basel started taking off. But is there really a need to do this? And could uh, different central banks set their own regulatory requirements? So let me start with why regulate banks. And uh, obviously, one reason is the structure makes them fragile. We saw that in the last, uh, last session. Second, they play a very big role in payments, in, in uh, uh, essentially a utility-like function. Uh, third, not only are they utilities, but they also are utilities that occasionally go crazy. Why do they go crazy? Do they go crazy in a special way? That's the third reason to regulate banks. Uh, fourth. Authorities have powers that banks do not have and can ac actually fill in some of the holes uh, in banking. That's the fourth reason to do it. And the fifth is because the authorities can do it, you create problems of moral hazard, and therefore you have to regulate banks once again. It's regulation breeds regulation. That's the fifth reason. So I want to walk through these reasons. I will spend little time on this. We know banks have illiquid assets financed by demandable liabilities. We'll see a variety of reasons during this um, conference as, as to why this is the case. But of course, that creates fragility. Now, the obvious fragility that you want to regulate for is panics. Stuff happens, sunspots happen, and suddenly people run. Perhaps there you want to intervene. 
Less clear that you want to intervene for these other two reasons, but there are reasons why we do intervene. Banks are very highly levered, therefore small changes in asset values can result in bank insolvency. If those changes can be prevented or if intervention can prevent the bank runs that occur, maybe that's a good thing because that collapses asset values. Um, and the third reason uh, why uh, you may want to intervene is aggregate liquidity shortages. I'll come to that in a little bit. Um, the second big reason to regulate banks apart from their leverage is the idea that there are externalities uh, slash the performer utility function which they don't uh, fully uh, internalize. Uh, the the um, you know Friedman Schwartz uh, view that the Great Depression was caused by collapse in monetary aggregates because of the collapse of banks, perhaps because uh, they were no longer available for pay the payments function and so on. Uh, that certainly is a very important view. Uh, ben sort of adds to that or, or complements that with a non-monetary view, which is that what really collapsed was the lending function. And uh, there are various versions of this that have since been elaborated on that this, uh, you know, there are these bank firm relationships which Ben talks about, but documenting those bank firm relationships and the consequences, a variety of literature talks about that. So it's very hard to reestablish these relationships ab initio, takes time, and therefore a bank collapse can have uh, serious effects on activity because borrowers cannot borrow given that their banks no longer exist. A third rationale, of course, is, is fire sale externalities. Uh, uh, we heard some talk about that. It's a pecuniary externality, but it can feed back into uh, serious consequences through bank failures, uh, through uh, upfront uh, leverage, and so on. Um, there are various versions of these uh, uh, fire sales causing problems. In Allen and Gale, uh, what happens is fire sales reduce the value of, of banks uh, through the linkages they have with other banks, other banks also go down, so the entire system goes down because of ex ante linkages within the banking system. But it turns out you don't even need ex ante linkages. You can also have everybody dipping into the common pool for liquidity as that common pool dries up, especially if there are bank failures which add to a greater charge on that common pool of liquidity, the pool can dry up very quickly, and as a result, asset values can collapse because of fire sale prices, and you can have a contagion in, in, in the system, uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's work that Doug and I have done. So um, that's, that's uh, a, a fire sale reason for regulating banks. And then there are reasons which relate to the fact, the fact that banks are important, so you want to pay attention to them, but they also do things which are unnatural, which, which, which don't really happen as much uh, elsewhere. Uh, banks, uh, in uh, John's work, are highly levered entities and essentially express their optimism uh, through their leverage. Uh, they take large positions, which eventually could turn out to be problematic. Uh, in uh, Schleifer and Vishni uh, and uh, Nicola, uh, they, how do you pronounce that? Genaioli. Genaioli. Genaioli, Schleifer and Vishni, uh, they, uh, they, uh, they talk about neglected risks. Uh, and of course, uh, if the banks neglect those risks, when those risks actually materialize, they could have serious effects uh, on the system. Now, uh, these could be of non-bank entities also, but there are other uh, features which might be more specific to banks, uh, that in banks, it's very hard to tell the true state of banks, uh, that in fact, for example, loans can always be rolled over through fresh lending, so it's very hard to know whether the loan is bad or not until effectively the music stops and you're not able to lend anymore, you're not able to evergreen anymore. And uh, uh, there are papers which look at this, but uh, there's also, uh, and this is something we haven't explored as much theoretically, uh, there is the role of interbank competition uh, of the supply side, uh, which sort of seems to go uh, a little haywire at times. Uh, Atif uh, uh, and Amir have, uh, have papers suggesting there was a supply effect a in the rollout of mortgages which didn't pay attention to credit risk or to pricing. 
Uh, but in, in work with, uh, uh, with Rodney Ramcharan and uh, more recently uh, with Grania and, and Lloyds, uh, we sort of show that interbank competition has an effect on credit quality, that areas which have more competition tend to have a much sharper deterioration in uh, the kind of uh, credit risk that they take on and the subsequent uh, denouement. In, in the paper with Rodney, we, we show it uh, in the lead up to the Great Depression during the farm crisis in the, in the 1920s. And uh, with Grania and Lois, we show this in, uh, in, uh, in the more recent crisis. Interestingly, uh, in the more recent crisis, what you can see, uh, one way of picking up this, this sort of overextension of banks is by looking at the distance at which they lend, right? Distance still matters. It's not true that we have public information on all, all uh, sort of uh, bank aspects. Uh, banks still lend very close by. They don't lend at a distance. What you see during the crisis, in the lead up to the crisis, is banks go out on a limb. They extend, they lend at a much greater distance than the trend lines suggest distances are increasing, and after the crisis, they come back down. Uh, they, they sort of shrink their lending. The extension of lending to greater distances is most pronounced in the most comparative areas, where the banks are most comparative. It seems as if they don't find uh, normal stuff to lend to, they go out on a limb, they make big losses, they don't price accordingly, and that's a problem. Uh, inter There's something about interbank competition which causes uh, uh, this which is worth thinking about. And of course, there's malfeasance or, or fraud. One example of the malfeasance of fraud that is, that is uh, present in banks is the paper by Amit and others, uh, which shows that you know, banks, uh, in a sense, misrepresented whether there was, in fact, a second lien on these mortgages or not that had big effects on, uh, on mortgage, mortgage failure. So all these possibilities uh, would suggest uh, that given they're important, but given that they can misbehave, there's an additional reason for regulation and supervision. Uh, more, uh, uh, an interesting reason which has emerged in the last few years is uh, really that they have powers uh, that banks, that the authorities have powers that banks do not have. Uh, I think we heard about the Holmstrom Tirol view, that is, uh, because uh, the authorities can tax uh, uh, future income, future wealth, uh, and they can inject value into the banking system, they provide an important role of essentially contributing value when there's value erosion and allowing investment to take place as a result. Uh, but of course, we also know from for a long time that central banks have the ability to expand their balance sheet and as a result, deal with situations of illiquidity by taking on the illiquid assets on their balance sheet, substituting them with liquid, uh, with liquid central bank uh, promises. Um, and then, because the central banks intervene to provide liquidity at certain times, because there's a, uh, um, a central bank put, or because uh, there is uh, the central bank intervention to prevent bank failure, because there's deposit insurance, all this could creates the possibility of moral hazard. We know of the risk-shifting moral hazard, uh, which was demonstrated in the SNL crisis, and there's been a substantial amount of work that has been done since on that. But there's also uh, increasingly a focus on the moral hazard created by expected liquidity support or expected accommodative policy. Uh, for example, Jeremy talks about the fact that this leads to uh, more leverage as also uh, Emmanuel and Jean Tirol. It also leads you to uh, invest in in more illiquid assets, and and one of the things that Doug and I have been working on most recently is to say not only does it uh, make you take on more leverage, but because you have a very effective system of collection, a very effective system of uh, borrowing when assets are very liquid, you essentially neglect all other. Uh, sort of sources of borrowing. You don't keep up, for example, your internal governance so as to convince the markets that you're good for it because the markets know when assets are very liquid, they can always recover from you by selling those assets. In other words, good times with plenty of liquidity tend to crowd out the focus of firms on maintaining other sources of borrowing capacity. When that liquidity dries up, you're left high and dry because you've neglected this other aspect. And in a sense, this is almost 
uh, uh, inevitable because in times of great liquidity, you borrow a lot, which essentially that high leverage causes underinvestment in these other sources of, uh, of borrowing capacity, and that leaves the system too illiquid in bad times. Um, now let me uh, turn to what forms micro prudential regulation takes. Post-crisis, a lot of the focus has been on capital requirements. Uh, and essentially, there are three reasons why one could say uh, more capital is a good thing. One is focusing on governance by equity being in a sense better because the equity holders have more at stake than governance by debt. I would argue against this. Uh, in general, governance by equity holders has proved very ineffective. Equity holders don't know what's going on. I mean, having sit on, sat on a bank board, I know. There's very little you know about what's going on. It's what the management tells you. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, Martin Helwig has a quote from uh, Karl von Furstenberg, which uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact quote. It was something like, uh, equity holders are stupid and impertinent, and stupid because they give the money to you, and impertinent because they expect a dividend for their stupidity. Uh, uh, but, but I think that that reflects the. Uh, I, I'm sure I'm misquoting, but Martin will set set me straight. Uh, that uh, reflects the attitude of bankers, and to some extent, that was the attitude of the Lehman Bo uh, Lehman management also towards its board. Its board consisted of a variety of people who certainly had no capacity to assess the risk of the bank. What stopped Lehman was essentially the bank run. So one could argue that the bank run for Lehman prevented actually much worse erosion of value over time. I won't go there, but I, I would argue that Lehman was not stopped by its equity holders. Lehman was actually stopped by the debt holders, and uh, as, as Ball suggests, it was stopped just about when it became insolvent. That, that was the value of the equity at that point. A second reason for capital requirements is a budget constraint for risk taking. So essentially, I, I take risk, which is limited by the amount of capital I have. That's probably a more modern reason why capital requirements work. But I would argue that most, most likely the reason capital requirements work is essentially they're a buffer against, against loss. And uh, uh, you know, the more capital we have, uh, the more there is this loss-absorbing buffer. Of course, the cost of having more capital is you have more long-dated liabilities, which puts less essential discipline on the banks. And there's this trade-off. Uh, on the one hand, you're more stable. On the other hand, your cost of capital goes up. And that leads to a debate which we have in recent times. Uh, what is the optimal amount of capital for banks? And uh, there's an extreme school, which um, you know I, I, I would sort of caricature it, and I'm probably not uh, giving it full weight, that in effect, we are in a Modigliani-Miller world back again with banks, and therefore the amount of leverage doesn't really matter. We can mandate 100% equity. At least we can mandate significantly more without having an effect on the bank's cost of capital. And uh, Doug and I are in the opposing camp to some extent saying, that yes, there is some value to equity, and more equity will be, make more stability, but could increase the cost of capital, and you have to trade it off. There is an interior level of equity. Uh, there are, of course, uh, new regulations of liquidity. Let me skip over this uh, uh, because of time. Uh, there are now, uh, in a variety of banking systems, a focus on supervision uh, which always has been there, but more interestingly, stress tests. What is the value of stress tests? Uh, my sense is, is the real value is of cleaning up the walking wounded, essentially figuring out who really is problematic and taking them out of the system because when they're in the system, they create significantly more problems. They create an overhang of, of bad assets, and that overhang of bad assets has significant uh, uh, creates significantly difficulties for good firms because it creates competition which doesn't really focus on maximizing value, but it also creates a problem uh, for credit because it creates the possibility of an entity going bust and dumping assets on the market, uh, essentially creating fire sale prices, which creates a profit opportunity down the line. Anticipating that profit opportunity, even healthy banks may withhold uh, credit 
in the, uh, I, I, when, when they see a lot of walking wounded. Having a lot of walking wounded in the banking system is not a good recipe for either having a healthy uh, real system or he having healthy credit because it tends to impede that flow. Um, and along these lines, uh, uh, Claud Claudia Borio at the BIS talks about uh, these, uh, these stress tests as really building confidence that the system is clean rather than giving any early warning that the system is heading into trouble. It's really about post-crisis saying, yes, the system is clean, guys go out and lend, things are fine. Uh, another set of interventions post-crisis uh, that typically happens is changing the structure of banking. Chari already asked about some versions of ring fencing or narrow banking, uh, possibly. Uh, post uh, the Great Depression, we had Glass-Steagall. Uh, uh, this time we had the Volcker Rule. Some talk about breaking up the bank, which didn't happen. Increasingly talk that if banks are providing liquidity and are not very good at providing liquidity, why doesn't the central bank take it over? Again, we had a little discussion of that. In general, these arguments for regulating bank structures usually come uh, essentially after crises and often are tinged with political payback. We want to regulate the banks because we've always wanted to regulate the banks. Uh, we think they're, uh, they're, they're problematic, and this crisis gives us a chance to do it. For example, in the 30s, as Randy Crossan and I show, there's no evidence that the banks actually did something bad before the uh, uh, Great Depression. They were just like everybody else. Everybody went crazy, the banks also went crazy. However, the banks got Glass-Steagall because Carter Gra Glass had been working for 30 years to essentially uh, sort of subdue the power of the banks, and he got the chance when the banks uh, sort of failed during the Depression. And there's stuff on compensation regulation. Let me talk a little bit about regulatory incentives, and then I'll come to my last slide. Essentially, as regulators, we tend to be underactive ex ante and overactive ex post. Uh, we have uh, the theory that we take away the punch bowl when the party gets going. We're much more comfortable with picking up the pieces once the party is broken up and everybody's lying around. So uh, really, this is where we focus. This is the theory. We have pro-cyclical regulation. That's a fact. Uh, we liberalize into the boom because everything's going fine. It's very hard to push, uh, to take away the punch bowl at that time. Nobody uh, except the regulator has an interest in taking away the punch bowl at that time. Uh, and post-crisis, of course, we've re -found our we've, uh, rediscovered our backbone, and we tend to over-regulate. The problem is when we over-regulate post-crisis, it creates the impetus to deregulate again as the memory fades. Now, in the 30s, it took 70 years approximately, or 65 years, to start deregulating again. This time, it's barely 10 years, the body is barely buried, we're back to deregulation because we overregulated. So, uh, I, I, let me put overregulated within quotes, I'm not sure, but, but uh, let me skip past this and go to this last uh, slide. How much time do I have? One minute? Yeah, one minute. Okay, so ongoing debates. Should monetary policy address financial stability? Uh, the monetary policy, um, so sort of guys who wanted to be focused said no, monetary policy has limited effects. Um, the BIS crowd and some of us in this room, including Jeremy and I, believe no, no, monetary policy affects liquidity and that can create uh, problems. As Jeremy puts it very nicely, it gets into all the cracks. Um, the second uh, uh, reason no is it overcomplicates monetary policy setting and communication and the usual point about targets and instruments, uh, let's not overcomplicate monetary policy by overburdening it with targets. Uh, the argument uh, uh, for weaving it into the medium-term inflation uh, forecast targeting framework is essentially, look, yes, we have potentially more targets than instruments. That means we have to pick trade-offs. We have to work with what we have. And maybe we can discover some additional instruments. And this is where the monetary policy uh, sort of, uh, uh, I'm going to say crowd for... Uh, 
uh, just for the sake of brevity, uh, would say, look, no, no, we can get separation again by using macroprudential regulation. Use macroprudential for the financial side, let monetary policy do what it can do best, which is focus on, on, uh, on inflation. And the problem with macropru is it's really untested and partial, and uh, in many situations, uh, it's really feeble compared to monetary policy. Monetary policy, uh, when, uh, uh, again, repeating Jeremy, uh, is, is powerful, gets into all the cracks, and therefore uh, it's worth using. Let me stop there and uh, turn it over to the next speaker. <laughs>